Muito boa tarde a todos. É um enorme prazer iniciar esta edição especial do FIRS com Vida, edição especial de Oma Shoa, nessa tarde de domingo, recebendo um convidado super especial, o professor Dan Mirman, do Yad Vashem. É um enorme prazer para todos que estão se conectando conosco, recebê-los e poder participar desse evento tão importante, com uma figura tão renomada do Yad Vashem, que vai nos trazer reflexões certamente muito importantes sobre a Shoah. Eu já adianto a todos que a condução da live será em inglês, né? portanto, não temos como fazer em português, uma vez que o professor Dan fala inglês ou hebraico, evidentemente, mas, se possível, nos comprometemos a, numa segunda etapa, legendar essa live e disponibilizá-la para todos né? que possam assisti-la, independentemente da compreensão ou não do idioma inglês. Então, dando início... Professor Dan, welcome to our show. Dan Mikman, head of the International Institute of Holocaust Research and incumbent of the John Nachman Chair in the Holocaust Studies, Yad Vashem, Emeritus Professor of Modern Jewish History and former Chair of the Arnold and Leona Finkler Institute of Holocaust Research, Barilan University. His publication covers a broad array of topics regarding the Holocaust, its impact and memory, with a special focus on historiography, conceptualization, and methodologies. Professor Dan, welcome. Tell us about yourself. How do you start, did you start uh, learning about the Holocaust and uh, all your, your road to this, uh, this moment uh, when you are such an emeritus professor and uh, so recognized figure? Good evening, or for me, and for you, good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and well, the, um, my personal path is a little bit twisted. Uh, I was born to uh, Dutch Holocaust survivors in Amsterdam in 1947. Uh, they wanted to make Aliyah already uh, in uh, 1939, uh, recently, uh, we found a letter that my father wrote. He wanted, in 1939, just before Pesach, he wanted to write his PhD thesis at the Hebrew University. It was uh, turned down because the, uh, the uh, mandate uh, government, the British government, didn't want to give uh, certificates for people at that moment. And uh, the Netherlands was uh, occupied by Nazi Germany in May 1940. And so my parents uh, came under uh, the German regime. They married in September uh, 1940. Uh, my older brother was born in 1941 and hidden on Yom Kippur in 1942. Uh, and he survived with uh, uh, righteous Gentiles. Uh, my parents, uh, because they were had applied for Aliyah certificates, they uh, were put later on on a special list, the Palestine list, as it was called, uh, for exchange for uh, Germans in Eretz Israel. Um, they, in the end, were not uh, exchanged. Uh, my grandmother and two aunts were exchanged in 1944, uh, but my parents not. But due to that, they survived and uh, returned to the Netherlands, first uh, collecting... Uh, my uh, my brother and some other relatives, uh, for instance, two children of my aunt. Uh, my aunt and my uncle were murdered, but the children were also hidden. So my parents took uh, them in. And uh, my father restarted his activities as a uh, leader of the Zionist uh, Federation in the Netherlands and also the editor of the Jewish Weekly. Uh, but uh, my parents, from the very first moment after the, after the Shoah, wanted to make Aliyah. And uh, in 1957, that was materialized after uh, my father, who had finished his PhD thesis at the University of Amsterdam in 1951, uh, was asked by the then... Uh, chairman of Yad Vashem, uh, Professor Ben Sion Dinur, to come and be the director of Yad Vashem. And so we made Aliyah. And I can say that I'm, in a way, the oldest employee of Yad Vashem. I was almost 10 years old when I came there, and my father was the director, so I played around at that time. 
but later on, I was more interested in uh, uh, in uh, uh, ancient history of the Jewish people, in biblical history. And after uh, finishing uh, my high school and serving in the army, I started uh, linguistics and uh, uh, in the history of the uh, biblical period. Uh, and but gradually I changed uh, and moved to the modern period, and I ended up with writing a uh, PhD thesis on the German Jewish refugees uh, uh, in the Netherlands uh, between 1933 and 1940, that is before the occupation of the Netherlands. And uh, I wrote, uh, I did research for my uh, studies in uh, the Netherlands, and at that time I taught at the University of Amsterdam. And when we, re with my wife and uh, two children, returned uh, to Israel, I was uh, uh, given the job of uh, teaching the Holocaust at uh, Bar Ilan University. Uh, and uh, so I moved into this. A topic in, in actually uh, and fully in 1976. Um, so, from my perspective, I could have landed uh, in antiquity also, but uh, here, here I am. Uh, my wife says that I was predestined to that because of my parents at the background. And of course, at home, I heard a lot about the Shoah and their own their experiences during the period. They were in Westerbork, it's the uh, concentration camp in the Netherlands. They were in Bergen-Belsen and they were liberated in uh, East Germany by the by the Red Army in 1945. And um, so they had a lot of uh, uh, they, they experienced the Shoah in a certain way. Uh, people around me, uh, around our family, were survivors. So there is that that background. But I really came inter became interested in the topic in the 1970s, and from that moment onwards, uh, I worked on uh, that uh, enormous. Uh, history, which is uh, infinite uh, in a way, uh, and um, in uh, towards the end of the 1990s, when the well-known professors uh, Yehuda Bauer and uh, Israel Gutman uh, decided to leave the Yad Vashem Research Institute, they asked me to join it together with another a colleague from the Hebrew University. He died, uh, unfortunately, in uh, 2010. He, by the way, originated <coughs> from uh, Argentina. And um, uh, since the year uh, 1999, uh, I'm working at the Yad Vashem and uh, first as chief historian and now as uh, head of the Yad Vashem Research Institute. Great, great, really, really impressive. Uh, professor, many years have passed since the Holocaust. We have less and less survivors every year. Uh, the new generations are not in direct contact with uh, people who survived the Holocaust. That make it uh, even more difficult to remember and to tell the story because it's, it's going far away in history. Uh, why is so important to remember the Shoah nowadays uh, is the message still uh, important and how we can make that uh, with the new generations? Uh, well, I think uh, the memory of the Shah is important and there are lessons to be learned. Um, but I first uh, want to say that uh, as, as uh, weird as this must be, uh, uh, look now from the perspective of today that uh, the way for the survivors to uh, become central in the memory of the Holocaust was paved actually by researchers. Uh, during the early years uh, after the Shoah, uh, a lot of survivors testified and so, but their testimonies were uh, kept aside. And uh, the memory was uh, via 
um, the state organisms, the state of Israel, the Jewish communities, uh, and the survivors were not so much invited to speak and were not public figures. Uh, and re but on the other hand, research on what led to the to the Shoah and how people lived uh, that that started I immediately after. Uh, the end of the Shoah, and it was undertaken this project by a lot of survivors. Uh, so the first historians of the Shoah and the also sociologists were survivors, uh, but not uh, in a way of testimonies. And uh, the uh, research developed, and uh, since about the 1970s, uh, when, there, uh, when the survivors as established themselves, uh, when they had uh, started to have grandchildren, uh, when there was more openness to listen to that story, uh, the survivors become central. And of course, their, uh, their testimonies, their memoirs are very important, and especially uh, they became important towards the end of the 1980s with the journeys to Poland and with public commemorations. Uh, but we have to remember that uh, the breakthrough came in the 1980s when public remembrance of the Holocaust went beyond the Jewish communities to the open public and uh, became central, uh, I would say, in the whole Western world and even uh, and even beyond. Uh, just think about it that in 2005, the United Nations declared the 27th of January as an annual uh, Remembrance Day uh, for the Holocaust. So the situation now is entirely different than it was uh, some 40 and 50 years ago. And of course, we are going to miss uh, the survivors, but they left behind them a lot of memoirs and testimonies which are utilized. And for instance, there is what is called the Spielberg uh, collection uh, that can be accessed uh, in various ways. And there are a lot of other collections at Yad Vashem, uh, at Yale University. So the voice of the survivors is, will stay with us. And uh, it's even impressive to see how many testimonies there are. There is no other historical event for which there are so many uh, testimonies. And indeed, of course, and that is natural that with the passing of time, uh, the survivors will disappear and we'll have to approach the memory in different ways, not through a, a, um, the presence of the of the survivors, but I think if I look back at uh, the extent of interest in the Shoah 50 years ago in the world, I'm speaking, uh, and w what the situation is now, then uh, I think that uh, in the forthcoming decades and. Uh, for a very long time, it will remain a central issue. Now, what what we can learn uh, for uh, from the Shoah is, uh, on the one hand, the Jewish lesson, of course, and that is uh, <clears throat> to be assertive, to protect yourself, and also to fight anti-Semitism, being uh, on the alert all the time, and finding um, uh, people who uh, of non-Jews who are ready to work with us in this uh, in this battle on the other hand we have to remember another thing and that is we have to properly understand what the Nazi mission the Nazi goal was and the anti-jewish campaign uh, started with the ascendance of Hitler to power in 1933 the, Sh the Shoah is not just the genocide of the Jewish people. The genocide of the Jewish people was a major part, and of course, from our perspective, the worst part of, uh, of the Shoah. But the Shoah, it was much more. And we have to understand, and Hitler wrote it in his first political writing in 1919, and afterwards also in Mein Kampf, and you can find it all over in the Nazi um, documentation, that they also spoke about the Jewish Geist, the Jewish spirit. Now, the Jewish spirit, in their interpretation, is not what we call Yiddishkeit, 
but the idea of um, uh, of human equality. And they said capitalism, socialism, uh, communism, they're all the same. Democracy, they're all the same. They speak about human equality. And that runs counter to nature because in, the na in nature there is hierarchy and there is no equality be between the lion and, uh, and the sheep, for instance. And also between human beings there is no equality. So the idea of equality is undermining nature. And what is the origin of the uh, of the this idea of equality that is Jewish because because the uh, Jewish uh, conceptualization of the world is that there is the creation the creation started with one person and therefore all humanity are the descendants of one person and therefore there is equality and there is in the Talmud also an explanation why this is so, that nobody will be able to say your father was more important than my one. But what they said is, from Judaism, it was transferred to Christianity, from Christianity uh, to modernity, uh, <clears throat> to liberalism, socialism, communism, and so on. So the other lesson that is to be learned from the, from the Shoah is that we have to preserve this idea of uh, human equality of human equality counter to those who want to raise racist uh, ideas and therefore we can cooperate with other groups who are fighting for this same ideal professor dan very good to have you here finally meeting you thank you yes it's a great honor I will ask you about the Holocaust denial. Uh, you know, the, the never again that you say, to make it real, we have to counter it with education and history and preserving the memory. And the Holocaust denial is exactly the opposite of it. The Holocaust denial at the end of the day will make the never again, not never again. So, it's, so that's what the importance of uh, memory preservation. And you have different kinds of denial, as we spoke, the, the, the regular denial that they just conspiracy theories that didn't happen, but you have more subtle kinds of denial, like people that say that we spoke enough about it. There is Hollywood spoke enough about it, that uh, Zionism takes benefit from, uh, from the Shoah. There's another kind, and there's a third kind also of, uh, of a novel form of denial, that is the false comparisons, the false parallels that tries to uh, equalize the Shoah with other phenomena, mainly uh, most prominently the, the Palestinian uh, issue that makes completely inadequate qualitative and quantitative comparisons. So uh, what would be the strategies to fight Holocaust denial in all its forms? Oh, that's a uh, difficult question, and there are a lot of organizations who are trying to cope it, and uh, as we can see, uh, we are not always successful. Uh, of course, first of all, knowledge is of importance, but it is, it is not enough. Um, and uh, I would say there are various forms of... Uh, of denial, it's it's not only denial because when we say it, deniers that they deny the whole event, it still exists. It was in a way more important uh, some two, three, four decades ago. The the major deniers at the time uh, have gone away, but still in uh, in some several parts of the world uh, the holocaust uh, is denied entirely and we know it for instance from iran where they are not ready to accept the idea at all um but uh, uh, nowadays i would say the issue of distortion uh, Relevating uh, the, the the Shoah, uh, saying all genocides are the same, um, and not seeing the the uh, essential difference 
uh, of the anti-Jewish campaign and how many participated in all over Europe and not only uh, in Europe with it. And uh, of course, there is the issue, as you mentioned, of the comparisons, right? So in uh, many uh, discussions, uh, it can be anti-Israel, sometimes also by uh, good-hearted people, uh, they make uh, the comparison, uh, get to here, get to there. Um, uh, a, a massacre, uh, which is horrible, but of 50 people is compared immediately to a genocide uh, and so on. So uh, education still remains a major tool and there are a lot of uh, efforts and, and programs, of course, done all over, but it has to be accompanied with, uh, with political action. Uh, and there are uh, quite a number of organizations who are working on that. There is an international organization, the, uh, the IRA, as it is called, is an acronym, that's International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, with thir 34 uh, uh, states. Uh, being part of, and uh, they uh, are committed to legislation, uh, to prosecution uh, of uh, denial and distortion. Um, but uh, it is an ongoing battle, uh, and we cannot rest on the on our feathers, because we see that there is a uh, an upsurge, uh, also right wing and also left wing. Um, in Eastern Europe, we can find uh, especially uh, right-wing uh, uh, Holocaust distortion and sometimes also denial. On the other hand, we can see, we've, we saw it in, in uh, Britain, uh, where left-wing anti-Semitism uh, is on the rise. Um, and uh, it happens also in the United States and other parts. And um, so uh, the anti-Semitism uh, go goes together with knowledge of the Shoah. And sometimes uh, the images and the ideas about the Shoah are used against Israel, against Jews, and um, uh, also, in the, of course, in the conflict with, uh, with the Palestinians, uh, but not only there. And uh, therefore, um, well, I'm usually an optimistic person, but I'm also a realist. And uh, I can't say that uh, after uh, more than uh, 75 years after the Shoah, that uh, we think can uh, think that it is faded away and that we don't have to worry. We have to go on. Uh, with fighting and finding allies in uh, in this fight. Very nice. So, as you said, you are, op you are optimistic. I will bring some positive things to, to ask about. Uh, as you know, the, the Arab world was uh, very negationist uh, about the Holocaust because it was something ideological also that, they, that some people thought it was some causal nexus, the causative nexus with the Zionism and the creation of Israel. It was, they, 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 they didn't speak a lot about the Holocaust and some people uh, didn't know that exists and they deny and everything. But now we are seeing some, some refreshing winds in the region. And we saw here that there were some events with the uh, with the uh, people from the Emirates and from Bahrain and some people from Saudi Arabia, are you optimistic that these new winds of peace and uh, normalization will also bring together a new page in Holocaust uh, acknowledgement and knowledge in the Arab world? <clears throat> well, I I think it may help, and uh, again, uh, these pictures of what is happening are always complicated, right? So for many years in the Arab world, and uh, by the way, especially in Egypt in the 1950s and 1960s, when 
some of you may remember that uh, some uh, German Nazi, uh, former Nazi experts helped uh, Egypt uh, in uh, building its army and missiles and, and so on. So at that time, there was a lot of uh, real denial that the Holocaust never happened. And that was used uh, in Arab propaganda throughout, not only by by uh, Egypt, but uh, also at the Palestinian movement and so on. And um, this uh, was uh, started to change around 1990 because uh, when the issue of the Shoah in the world throughout became so central, it became clear to some of uh, the Palestinian activists especially that denying the Holocaust is, uh, is actually harming uh, the Palestinian struggle. So the uh, idea or the concept that was brought forth was that we are the victims of the victims. So Europe uh, had some feelings of remorse after Shoah. Uh, the, the, the Europeans and the Western world gave the Jews a state, Israel, uh, and we are the victims of uh, that uh, of that process. So we, as the victims of the victims, should be uh, helped and aided, and uh, Israel also should be restricted in its uh, in its activities and um, and its uh, worldwide positive appeal. Um, so that was already a change, but not a change in a very favorite uh, direction. Uh, and then we found others also in Israel, right? Because in Israel, of course, the Shoah is a very central issue, and there is the annual uh, uh, Remembrance Day for the for the Shoah, which we just had last last week. And in uh, the Arabs in Israel uh, cannot uh, escape this context. Uh, also not in when they uh, learn at school and uh, they are encountered with it and of course with neighbors and with uh, the media. And uh, what happened is that there were several and still are several uh, Arab activists. There is a priest in uh, Nazareth uh, and uh, there are, uh, who started journeys to Auschwitz uh, there are an, other initiatives. There is one person who opened a, a at his home a museum uh, on the Shoah for the Arab audiences. There are a lot of Arabs who are vis visiting er, um, uh, school children who are visiting uh, the Lochamea Getaot, the Ghetto Fighters House in uh, the northern part of Israel, and. Uh, not only for a visit in museum, but also for courses and so on. And there are publications. So there is a change um, in uh, this uh, in a in a positive direction. Um, for instance, I also know very well a uh, a student, uh, an Arab student, uh, born in Akko. Her father was also a member of the Knesset. And, and she writes a PhD thesis on the Shoah in the, um, in the Arab media in Israel throughout the decades. By the way, very, a very interesting finding that she told me about was that during the Eichmann trial uh, in the Arab press, the Shoah uh, was uh, named the Nakba. Right at that time, so the term Nagba at that time was not uh, reserved for what they call the uh, the tragedy of 1948. Uh, so there are there are positive uh, directions, and uh, what we can see also with the Emirates and Bahrain and other. Uh, states and also in Egypt, in some circles, especially among certain and the intellectuals, that there is an interest in the Shoah. They understand that it is impossible to really deny it. Uh, you can deny it if you talk to ignorant people, but to educated people, it's impossible to deny because there's too much evidence, and it is a central issue in the whole world. 
at least in among politicians and intellectuals. And therefore, they become interested. And um, a good friend of mine uh, uh, showed around a delegation from the Emirates who came to Israel after the signing of the peace uh, agreement, and they visited the Yad Vashem during the corona crisis. Right? The, actually, the museum was closed, but it was open especially for them. And they were very interested, on the one hand, on the Jewish faith, and they, they compared it not to the fate of the Palestinians, but to the fate uh, of uh, the Muslims in, uh, in China and uh, in Myanmar, right? Said, so they tried to find some comparisons, at least for the uh, aspect of the murder and the pers uh, persecution. And uh, so we can see that there is an interest. Of course, they make their comparisons and they don't know too much, but I think it is really opening a path also uh, to other audiences in the uh, Arab and Muslim world. And I hope that it will lead uh, to more interaction and to more knowledge also in other countries, which uh, are still uh, now, till now, refusing to interact with Israel and the Jewish world. Hello, Professor. More than a pleasure. It's a real honor to talk to you today. So last year, I had the privilege to participate at the official event for the commemoration of the 75th year of Auschwitz liberation, together with more than 200 survivors and their families. Listening to years of reports on how Jews were treated in, in Poland, I always refrained to take this journey because I knew it wouldn't be easy to face that population without some kind of anger. Once there, walking in the streets of Krakowia, together with the rabbis and so many people easily identified as Jews, I have to confess that I was looking for trouble. Uh, I was ready to fight. But after some time, I realized just the opposite. Uh, we were really welcome there. Uh, after the end of the program, I took a car and went all the way to Warsaw. There, I went to Pauline Museum. I don't know if probably you know that museum, but it's the museum of a thousand yes, years maybe. of Jewish life in Poland. It's an amazing museum. And at the moment that I went in the museum, I saw dozens of children, some very young ones, all from Polish schools visiting the same museum. I was astonished uh, how amazing it was to see so many children there. And I began to change my mind. So uh, the question is, for most of my life, I thought that Poland was the most anti-Semitic country in Europe. But after this trip, I'm really not sure. What is your opinion? <laughs> well, you are touching a very sensitive issue. Um, because um, uh, you, you never should generalize about uh, societies, right? And uh, first of all, you said the most anti-Semitic country. I, I, I don't have a yardstick to measure uh, who is uh, the worst and so on. For me, it's important if there is considerable anti-Semitism. Now, uh, in Poland, there is a tradition, unfortunately, of, uh, of anti-Semitism, especially in the 20th century. There is a long history of Jews in Poland, and there was a lot of interaction. And uh, especially in the 18th century, uh, in the Polish Commonwealth, um, the status uh, was uh, interesting, but Jews were not uh, equal, of course. It was before the emancipation period. Uh, after uh, World War I, uh, with the new Polish state, uh, anti-Semitism was on the rise. And already in the 1930s, uh, Jews were excluded for a, from a lot of institutions. There were special ghetto banks at the universities where Jews had to sit. 
N uh, there was a numerous clauses. Not all Jews were accepted to everything. Uh, there were there were certain pogroms in the 1930s. Uh, there was the anti shrita law. So there was a lot of anti-Semitism going on, especially in a certain in nationalist uh, a, a party. Uh, there were also others uh, in uh, post. Uh, in the post uh, Shoah period, uh, there was also under the communist period, and I'm at this moment skipping the, the Shoah period uh, for a moment. And uh, with the turn of 1990, with the downfall of communism, right, and a uh, new liberal govern government, um, people were now allowed to, to speak out, and also research developed. And this brings me back to uh, to the Shoah period because research showed that uh, the situation was not rosy, right? And that, uh, of course, the Shoah was uh, conducted and by the Nazis was initiated by the Nazis, and the the, the Polish state was uh, torn into parts. There was no Polish state. Poland as an entity was not kept. There was the general government was a part that was that was annexed to Germany. Another part was went first to to uh, to the Soviet Union in 1939 and then was occupied. Uh, so there was no independent Poland. There was no state collaboration. But on the grassroots level, uh, there was a lot of anti-Semitism. And uh, recently. Uh, two researchers who wrote a very important book, uh, uh, Barbara Engelking and Jan Grabowski, were prosecuted and convicted because of the fact that they had written something about collaboration, right? And this is something that is going on in the past decade and in a very assertive way. And uh, you may remember that uh, some three years ago there was the, what's called the Polish Holocaust Law, uh, which uh, actually has an impact, as we can see until today, on the readiness of uh, youngsters to, to look into uh, the dark parts of Polish history. Now, nowadays, uh, I would say uh, Polish society is divided. And there is the, the, the more liberal part is ready to uh, encounter its past and they are interested in the Jewish history and what was lost, right? Because before, before the Shoah, there were 3 million or 300,000 Jews in Poland and there are now hardly several thousands, right? And Jews were very important in in Polish life, in uh, in, in medicine, in, in in other areas, and that has uh, been lost. Uh, so they are interested in this past, and the Polish Museum is uh, an expression of that, also. And there are other uh, memorials, and especially and you talked about Krakow, and of course in Krakow it's. Uh, uh, it's it's omnipresent there because also the Jewish community was very important uh, important there. But on the other hand, we have a a policy by uh, by the current government which wants to present Poland only as a a, a nation of rescuers, right? And that is a mis a, a very distorting misrepresentation. Right, uh, and the new studies by independent scholars shows uh, the uh, the extent of collaboration and anti-Semitism also in resistance movements to the Nazis. So uh, there is an interest in, in Jewish history. There are a lot of people who are ready to encounter uh, the dark. Uh, parts of the Polish past, but there is the other side, and therefore uh, it's uh, it's not uh, 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 white or black, and that's by the way not only in Poland; it's also in Ukraine, in Belarus, in Hungary, um, and even in some Western European uh, countries, right? So. 
uh, we always have to be very careful uh, in our uh, uh, analysis of what happens. Also in Lithuania, right? We have to remember also that some of the current heroes of the newly established and the newly independent states after 1990, the heroes that they take as models, as role models, were anti-Semitic leaders of uh, parties in the 1930s and the 1940s, who collaborated also with the Nazis. So it's, uh, it's a mixture and um, it is sometimes very problematic. Thank you, Professor. So today we remember 60 years of Eichmann's trial in Jerusalem. Uh, but last week, a Nazi camp guard that was deported from the US to Germany to face trial there had his case dismissed, and he's again a free man. Uh, actually, it, it was not the first case. Indeed, many Nazis in Germany had their trials ended without any convictions. What happened? Oh, well, that is a very, also a very complicated issue. Uh, if we look back for all those uh, 70 years, uh, because uh, for many years, uh, the legislation in Germany was such that it is what was hard to put on trial uh, people for uh, whom there was no clear evidence and if they had not carried out uh, a uh, murder by themselves directly. So being indirectly responsible for murder was not convicted. And that is, and that uh, especially in West, West Germany, that was uh, of importance. And therefore, and there are again uh, studies in recent years about what happened also in uh, in ministries, in state ministries and so on, and that a lot of Nazis were reintegrated into the West German system in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, in the Ministry of Interior and so on in the years afterwards. So not many people were put on trial. And even if we think about the Auschwitz trial in 1964, the, the, uh, there, the people who were put on trial were the minor figures in Auschwitz and not, not the bureaucrats who were somewhere behind them at the top. Uh, this changed some 20 years ago. And therefore, if, for instance, uh, if we talk, uh, if we think about Demian Yuk, who was tried in Israel, and, uh, it could, and, and in the end, uh, the Supreme Court, he was released because there was not a full proof of his role in Sobibor. He then was uh, later on extradited to Germany because the law in Germany changed and that the way of proving um, proving the guilt of somebody uh, was a lesser or the weight uh, was lesser than before. So people could now be tried again and Damien Luke was tried again. He died before the final verdict. So officially he was never convicted. Uh, in this in this uh, specific case that you mentioned, I haven't read yet the uh, the explanation, uh, exact explanation, so I cannot comment on that exactly. But uh, the interesting phenomenon is that uh, in recent years there were several cases where uh, in Germany uh, still people were prosecuted. Professor, uh, today we face uh, many, many situations, and especially in Brazil in the last times, uh, comparing uh, some, some people to the Nazis, saying that uh, something is it's Nazi, that some uh, thing that's been made uh, during uh, the COVID-19 crisis is uh, genocide and stuff like this. Uh, what we can compare and what we cannot compare to the, the Nazis, the Holocaust, and how to be careful with the memory of lots of people uh, that suffer with the Holocaust. Uh, what can you tell us about that? 
Well, unfortunately, there is uh, also a phenomenon of trivialization of the Holocaust. We could connect it with uh, denial and distortion, right? So using the images of uh, the Shoah for for everything. Now, this happens because it draws attention, because people all over the world have heard something about the, the Holocaust and that it is evil and horrible and so on. So if you compare, you uh, immediately draw attention to your topic. Uh, and therefore people are using these images and sometimes pictures and cartoons uh, and, and so on. So, but uh, and that is, uh, and that's actually very bad because that is uh, downplaying the meaning of the Holocaust. And that is one of our missions also to to keep the real understanding of what the Holocaust was, was about. Now, uh, what I would say is not to compare everything, and even uh, most of the things are incomparable, right? But we can learn from parts of it, right? We can uh, learn things about democracy, how you can fight racism, uh, you can learn. Uh, about attitudes toward Jews, and that is very important. So about anti-Semitism. Not everything uh, is uh, the same as Nazi anti-Semitism, but that anti-Semitism by itself can lead to worse situations, right? Uh, And that in the end, not only the Jews, but also others are affected. That is a very important lesson. So <clears throat> there are, uh, and, and we can learn, of, for instance, also from rescuers, right? Uh, so we can learn from the victims, we can learn from the per- perpetrators, we can learn from uh, the bystanders who not, n- how not to stay aloof of, uh, um, of uh, things of horrible things that happen that you can when you can do something just participate intervene do something and find the allies to fight uh, evil um, occurrences and policies and so on so there are things that can be studied and learned but not compared all the time and that that's the i would say that's the wrong thing usually it's done done with icons right so there is the yellow star uh, there is the entrance of auschwitz uh, and this kind of things and um, i feel very bad about it Uh, i have to admit that it happens Professor, so the time is fl- time is flying here. You know, it's 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 uh, it's amazing how time flies. Uh, I I have a question, not a question. Actually, I want you to to leave a message to people that educate the younger generations because time is passing and the, the and the, the 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 thing is becoming much far away, much. Uh, below us and the the, the, the future madrichim and the future scholars the future teachers of the new generation what kind of message you can give them and uh, what kind of programs and uh, and the interactions exchange programs they can find in yad vashem and uh, mostly in the, at the yad vashem and also all, not only teachers and and madrichim but also institutions journalists and other scientists so at Yad Vashem, we have an international school for uh, Holocaust studies, which is another part. I am at the research institute, but this is for Holocaust studies. And that's actually the educational um, wing of Yad Vashem. And they have some 130,000 or even more uh, people who come and attend courses and so on. And there are a lot of programs and for different audiences. So because there is for uh, the Haredi community and then for the liberal community and then it's for for Christians and so on. So uh, and uh, so there are there are a lot of um, 
there are a lot of programs at Yad Vashem and uh, you can connect with Yad Vashem and uh, they will definitely, uh, that with the School of Holocaust Studies and they will definitely help you. There are other institutions also. Uh, but I think that there is a, uh, a development which is very interesting and was not initiated by Yad Vashem. Uh, and that is become, um, has uh, become very common here in Israel and I think also outside. It's called here Zikaron Basalon. That is remembering in the, at home. The living room. In the living room. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and that is that people, uh, a family or some friends convene and they invite somebody who can tell them about the Shoah. It can be a lecture, it can be a personal story, and so on. My wife gives a very interesting talk about all, my, all the children in my family who were hidden with my uh, Gentiles, for instance. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think it's, it's interesting because it, it resembles... Lela Seda, right? If we think that we remember uh, Exodus from Egypt 3,000 years ago at home with the family or in an intimate way, right? And we're telling the story. And, uh, and remembrance that is transmitted via this pass is something that uh, can keep on, right? And the materials are there. There are memoirs, there are testimonies, there are studies, there are films, and so on. So that can be used in any uh, context, in any family, in any state, in uh, not only in the central places where you have ceremonies, but in the periphery, far away. And nowadays also we uh, got used to Zoom as we do now. So there are possibilities to transmit the memory uh, in new ways and in intimate ways. Right, uh, the ceremonies are important, but in a way they are rigid, and they remain official. And the individual, the grassroots individual, uh, stays outside of this. It is done by politicians, by organizers, and so on. Here, when you do it in this intimate uh, forum, then people get involved. And I think this is a very important way, and uh, that is the way, uh, like like Pesach, like Leila Seder, to continue the memory. And uh, I think that that will be a central way uh, for the generations to come uh, to remember the Shoah and to learn about the Shoah. Professor, uh, you mentioned about International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance anti-Semitism uh, definition uh, being adopted by many countries and organizations. We hope that Brazilian government will also adopt as soon as possible. Uh, the definition also states that demonizing and delegitimizing Israel is a kind of anti-Semitism. Uh, but some weeks ago, a group of progressive Jews said it's not really the case. What is your opinion? <clears throat> well, okay, another sensitive issue. I, th I think that, uh, uh, first of all, the IRA uh, definition is a working definition. It, it was to help uh, police and, uh, legis and legislators uh, who want to fight anti-Semitism uh, to understand what anti-Semitism is. And you have to check each case, of course. It... it it, uh, and it is also not exactly said that that criticizing Israel as such is a form of anti-Semitism. But if you deny the right of the Jews to have a state, right, that is a that is one form of uh, denying a Jewish rights which you um, ascribe to other other peoples, right? So does at that moment it enters. Uh, the field also or the domain of an anti-semitism and this uh, the new 
the new uh, definition that was proposed um, is mainly um, focused on the issue of Israel. If you read um, this uh, definition, they do not deal a lot with anti-Semitism in uh, in the world at all, especially not in leftist circles, because it gives actually a, a, a leeway to to the BDS, for instance. And in BD, BDS, uh, the major stream within the BDS movement is denying the right of Israel to exist at all, right? <clears throat> so, um, and uh, I think uh, there are a lot of problems with this uh, with this new definition. Even though a lot of uh, very good colleagues signed it, I think they didn't think about it uh, enough. Uh, nowadays, people sign uh, sign uh, all kinds of declarations, and uh, and uh, yeah, well, uh, this kind of definitions. Uh, they are asked in the evening, please sign until tomorrow morning, and they do it without reading it uh, carefully as they would have done with their historical sources. So I have some very good colleagues and, and friends who unfortunately also signed it, I think, without thinking about it uh, enough. And um, still, the IRA definition, I think, is is much better. Uh, the phenomenon of anti-Semitism is problematic, is 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 multifaceted, right? And uh, not always easy to identify. Um, Jews, especially outside Israel, uh, sense when it is anti-Semitism, right? You, you, you know it. You feel it, even if it is un hidden under a uh, several levels of nice words, right? Uh, you can sense when it when it is, uh, and I think that some of these uh, of of those who uh, signed uh, this the new definition uh, are not sensitive enough themselves. Professor, we are approaching the end of our conversation, and I would like you to, to tell some words about the Holocaust, like if you had only two minutes to tell someone about the Holocaust and its lesson, well, what would it be that lesson? Oh, that is really a, a question that is impossible to answer, right? <clears throat> what, I, what I can say is that... Uh, and that goes back to what I said before, that uh, 50 years ago, uh, the interest in the Shoah was not as it is today, right? E even if we think about denial. So deniers and, and distorters are also relating to it because it uh, has become a central uh, uh, event in a in the world's awareness, right? If you think about it, 50 years ago, World War II was in the center. Nowadays, World War II is less interesting than the Holocaust. And the Holocaust is studied in, uh, throughout the world and in Europe, uh, in countries that were involved in the, in the Shoah. And uh, so, uh, the, the issue that we still can learn new things about the Shoah and that on a daily basis there are new studies, right? The Yad Vashem Library receives annually some 4,000 publications. Think about it. So even if there were no holidays and no Shabbat and so on, then there would be uh, some 12, 13 publications per day on the Shoah. That's unimaginable so uh, and we learn all the time new things right it's not that we are repeating things from the past so the event is something that the more that we learn about it we can see how deep, deep it went into the culture of europe of the western world and uh, how important it is to learn about it in order to understand ourselves ourselves as jews and uh, what we what we can learn about our own history and how people uh, resisted 
also persecution and how they rehabilitated themselves after the Shoah. Uh, and, and we can learn uh, more about um, how to conduct politics properly. It is, does, uh, doesn't always materialize, but we can have a, an idea, a certain ideal or certain lesson from it uh, that can be uh, implemented in current situations. So it remains, it remains important. Well, Professor, thank you very much. It was a fantastic evening, and uh, I hope we get back together soon from another lecture, because uh, Holocaust is a never-ending lesson. All right, and I wish you uh, a, a speedy recovery from the uh, corona crisis in uh, Brazil. Um, maybe we can send from here, from Israel, uh, a um a good hope for the future and uh, i wish you all the best thank you so much for accepting our invitation it's a great honor we would certainly many people will see this conversation because it was so full of content and lessons and uh and i hope to see you personally as soon as possible here or in israel or both Amen, amen. Yes, that's it. Thank you very much, Professor. Hope to see you soon, hopefully soon. in Israel. Litraot. Litraot. Toda rabá. Muito obrigado a todos pela audiência. Foi realmente uma tarde fantástica com o professor Dan Mirman. E nós voltamos na próxima quinta-feira com o Filhos Convida, no nosso horário tradicional das 20 horas. A todos, um bom final de domingo e até quinta-feira. <música>